everyone, and thank you so much for coming to this session. Um, like Paul said, my name is Gaston Baquet. I'm a third year PhD student at the university, um, and I'm also an associate tutor at the School of Education. In this lecture, I'll discuss some of the opportunities and challenges I have found while doing participatory action research in higher education, particularly. Um, I will first go over some key ideas related to action research and participatory action research. Um, later, I will present specific aspects of the research I did with South American teachers. At the end of the session, you will have also an opportunity to reflect on how you might use this approach and share these reflections. Uh, please bear in mind, I'm not an expert by any means, um, and the purpose of this lecture is to share aspects of the research methodology in the hope that the opportunities and challenges I encountered might be of use to you as well if you're planning to use these approaches. So I have structured this session in four short sections. Uh, first, I'll go over the definitions of action research and participatory action research. I will then situate you in the context of my own work and provide you with a rationale on why I chose this approach in the first place. After this, I'll go into the details of the research itself, uh, including a detailed discussion of what worked, what can be improved, and possible challenges that need to be taken into consideration when doing participatory action research in a university setting. And finally, we'll have some time for a reflection task and some Q&A. So let's get started. Let's begin by introducing two key concepts that are at the core of this lecture. The first of this is action research. In addition to the explanation I have shown you on the screen, Reason and Bradbury define action research as an approach that begins with the question of how a specific situation might be improved and where the knowledge that answers that question is gained through action. Researchers generally agree that it is difficult to trace the history of action research, but they do agree that it originated as a critique to positivist science and that there are specific elements that distinguish it from other research methodologies. Amongst them, the relevance of the lived experiences, as well as the intellectual, philosophical, and political basis that precede them, and the complex network of relationships and influences that are the basis for the action research practice. The points I show you here offer a more detailed and concrete explanation of action research. To begin with, action research is a method used for improving practice. It involves action, evaluation, and critical reflection, and based on the evidence gathered, changes in that practice. This is why it's commonly used in education and the social sciences, but it is also used widely in healthcare. Uh, these are areas in which practice necessitates continuous improvement. Additionally, action research is meant to be both participative and collaborative. It is undertaken by individuals with a common purpose. And by individuals in this case, I mean the researcher and the participants. It is also situation-based and context-specific. It develops reflection based on interpretations made by the researchers and the participants. Knowledge is created through action in that we begin by investigating which actions are needed, we carry them out, reflect on what happened, and then engage in modified action. Action research can also um, lead to problem solving if the solution to the problem leads to the improvement of practice. And in action research, findings will emerge as action develops, but these findings are not conclusive or absolute. This is why action research is cyclic and contains different iterations, so practices can continue to be analyzed and improved upon. In their textbook, Becoming Critical, Knowing Through Action Research, Carr and Chemist identify three core elements that have come to define action research. Its participatory nature, its democratic drive, and the way it concurrently contributes to knowledge and practice. The participatory element translates into the active role that participants play in both the research stage and the change process. The democratic drive manifests in the way action research views participants and researchers as equals, with the latter acting in a capacity of what Koshi calls a facilitator for change. In practical terms, this means that participants are regularly consulted not only on the research process itself and how it will be assessed, but it also involves feeding incoming results back to the participants for corroboration and endorsement, all of which allows for the overall outcome of the process to have a meaningful personal connection. Finally, in relation to uh, action research contribution to both knowledge and practice, 
What this means is acknowledging the importance of connecting personal lived experiences with the existing situation, as traditional theories might not necessarily fit with a specific scenario. What has been described in textbooks as applicable knowledge in the UK will not necessarily be suitable in Chile or South Africa, for instance. And thus, observation, experience, and intuition become important. In fact, Mayer, research by Mayer argues that it's this connection between situation and experience that generates meaningful contextualized knowledge. When trying to visualize what action research might look like, this illustration by Koshi can be helpful. Uh, there are several authors who have illustrated this, but this here works as well in showing the key aspects of action research, particularly its iterative nature. There is a cycle of planning, acting, and observing, which is followed by a revised plan, and then off we go again. For instance, a teacher researcher might want to investigate the effectiveness of specific actions they take in the classroom. They could think about and design specific strategies, try them out in class, take note of what happens, and based on the evidence of these observations, reflect on possible changes that need to be made. The strategies then will be refined and tried out again, and thus we have the cycle in action. This brings me to the second key concept of today's lecture, which is participatory action research, or PAR. Like action research, PAR is structured based on specific stages which generally follow a pattern of planning, acting, reflecting, and evaluating. In looking at methods, PAR challenges the traditional social science approaches in that first, it requires a researcher to surrender control and assume the role of a facilitator rather than someone who decides every step of the process, sets the agenda, and otherwise makes every decision in terms of the direction of the research. Something I want to highlight here is the focus of this approach on trying to collaborate in changing specific situations affecting a community. In other words, rather than being researcher action, we have community action that seeks to improve the conditions of a social group by working together in every aspect of the research process. Just as described earlier in my explanation of action research, the participatory action research cycle begins by contemplating how a concrete condition might be enhanced. Following that inquiry, we engage in a cycle of action and reflection as shown here. Although there are several uh, versions of this cycle, this chart by Lassie et al. is particularly useful in that shows at a glance the different stages of PAR and what each stage involves. Now we'll begin to have a look at what PAR might look like in real life by going over my own research in Chile. Uh, to situate you within my own research context, I'll begin by saying that in 2019, Chile began experiencing extreme levels of social violence. What began as a series of demonstrations demanding social change and improved conditions for students and marginalized communities quickly escalated into a very serious and violent confrontations between civilians and the police. Public property was damaged, such as buses and train stations being burnt, civilians were blinded, and people lost their lives in these confrontations, which lasted for about two months and ended, thankfully, when the pandemic came. I was not in Chile at the time, so I was witnessing this from, uh, from afar with great personal pain and shock. This violence also spread into the school context. The photos you see here correspond to a public bus that was burned by a group of students right outside a public school and to a school classroom that was burned and vandalized. So it was this situation that prompted me to think about ways to contribute in some way to de-escalate the situation by working with teachers in first identifying specific instances of violence they had encountered and then develop strategies that might assist in dealing with direct and cultural violence, specifically in the context of classrooms. A second important reason to do this research in Chile concerns the changes in classroom demographics which has in turn led to many documented instances of social and cultural violence. A significant number of migrants who have moved there in the past three years have done so from Venezuela and Haiti, two countries with a different cultural and ethnic landscape to the one you find in Chile. In fact, a recent report produced by the National Institute of Statistics and the Department of Foreign Affairs lists Venezuelan migrants at 23% of the total foreign population and Haitians at 14%. And within that, 15% are children and adolescents. 
These numbers are important because as recent research highlights, unlike other countries in Latin America where schools and classrooms have facilitated cultural assimilation, Chilean schools have historically been exclusive rather than inclusive, placing high value in the construction of a uniform and homogenous identity. What these numbers mean um, in practical terms is that Chilean teachers are increasingly faced with the reality of greater cultural diversity. And in that context, it is important to imbue our pedagogical practice with a desire to engage with others through a more empathetic lens and to encourage students to broaden their appreciation for those they have grown accustomed to see as strangers. All of these were contributing factors at choosing PAR for me as an approach and teachers as participants slash co-researchers. Now, when thinking about my vision of this project prior to starting, I was inspired by this quote from Bradbury, which in my view encapsulates the dimension of a collective pursuit of a worthwhile objective. In this case, the objective was a transformation of violence into nonviolence and discrimination into inclusion. Of course, my idealistic mind envisioned this project before starting as non-hierarchical, with high engagement, everyone collaborating enthusiastically, everyone enjoying every single task, fully democratic participation, and enjoying every step of the process. But this vision, as I will show you, was not exactly what transpired. Having given you some context on what prompted you, what prompted me to do this research in Chile, I will discuss this in relation to my own project. To begin with, it was very clear to me that I wanted to do something with teachers rather than on them. I always believed that a participatory project where teachers were actively involved in generating relevant knowledge would have much more value for them. There are other reasons. Um, one of them is that PAR has strong roots in Latin America through the work of Paulo Freire and Orlando Falsborda from the 70s and after. And PAR also has a long history in education and community development through the work of Nicole Mira and Mel Ensko, amongst others. And these are both relevant to the project. Additionally, PAR seeks to shift the power balance, democratize the research process, and generate knowledge from the ground up rather than top down. And this, the democratization of the research spaces, was a key aim for the project. Finally, and very importantly, PAR focuses not only on generating knowledge, but to achieve radical social transformation through community-wide efforts. Because the main theme of the study was nonviolence education in school classrooms, working towards this transformation was very important. The theme of this research study was nonviolence education. This means bringing nonviolent perspectives into a teacher training program that could equip teachers with a range of tools they could use to deal with different manifestations of violence, such as exclusion, discrimination, and inequality in their classrooms. From that perspective, the study focused on three main areas, each interrogating different dimensions of violence and nonviolence. The first of these is how direct cultural and structural violence are linked to inequality. The second area we explored was how nonviolence action can counteract this inequality and exclusion by asking, how can we tackle this manifestation through a nonviolent approach? Finally, we explored how contemplative practices might help reshape our relationship with our social world. In other words, how do we achieve the necessary inner transformation to engage with the world in a nonviolent manner? I will now briefly share with you the main themes that were discussed as the project went along. The main aim, as I said earlier, was to explore how nonviolence could inform these teachers' pedagogy so they could address issues of exclusion and discrimination in their classrooms. To do that, they first became familiarized with Johann Galton and Judith Butler's definition of violence and its link to inequality, in addition to nonviolence as a path of action. We explored how nonviolent action has informed different social movements throughout history in an effort to create social change. And we also explored this from a decolonial non-Western lens, such as yoga philosophy, Gandhi, Satyagraha, or the African philosophy of Ubuntu. Additionally, we delved into our interconnectedness and interdependency with both humans and non-humans, and into how we can develop our classroom into actual communities of practice. When looking at the participants, this project was carried out in Chile with two groups of tra trainee teachers. Most of them were local Chileans, but there were also trainees from Venezuela and Colombia. 
It consisted of two iterations of a series of participatory workshops. The first had 14 participants who took part in seven sessions, while the second had 24 participants who attended 14 sessions. This flowchart offers an overview of how the project was planned and how the different aspects of the project fit within the action research cycle. It begins with the planning of the workshops themselves, their delivery, a period of reflection based on my own observations and participant feedback, a period for revising and modifying the sessions, and finally, a refined version of the workshops for the second iteration. So there was a period of two or three months between both iterations, which gave me enough time to take participant feedback on board, think about my own observations and modify the second set of sessions. I would like now to tell you how the workshops themselves were structured. Uh, this structure was the same for both iterations. The first step was done remotely, was to read a specific material shared with participants on that week's main topic, reflect on the reading, and then share this reflection with each other and with me. The second step done in person was a guided contemplative exercise, such as a short meditation, breathing exercises, reflective reading, or exercises for developing empathy or compassion. After completing this exercise, they shared their insights they might have had from the reading and reflecting. And this was followed by thinking about instances of violence they had witnessed, experienced, or perpetrated in their classrooms and collectively designed strategies that could help them and be used to address this violence. At the end of the session, each group shared their ideas with the whole audience. Sometimes it was done through a poster presentation, sometimes through a group discussion. I mentioned that the, this is looking at the first iteration. And I mentioned that the project consisted of two different iterations, right? So the first one included 14 participants involved in a course titled The Culture of English Speaking Countries. We had seven sessions to work on the themes that you see here which were embedded onto their course. So we had an initial session to introduce the project, five theme-oriented sessions, and then a final session for feedback. Now, considering the action research cycle I discussed earlier, and as a result of the reflection, action, observation, and planning, a few things were different from one to the other. First of all, participants were directly asked how much involvement they wanted to have, and this was accommodated to what they wanted. Uh, some participants wanted more involvement, some less, and this was accommodated for. We reached a consensual agreement on the weekly themes, and participants chose their own for three specific weeks. In the first iteration, because of time limitations, I chose the themes, whereas here participants had more time, and they suggested themes they wanted to discuss. The reflections were submitted as a group rather than individually, and the pre-session reading was done in a jigsaw manner. So they distributed the readings amongst the different group members and each person read something different, then they shared what they had read. This was done to lighten their workload since they were all university students enrolled in their own classes and they had to find ways to accommodate for all of this. I also gave them personalized feedback and comments on their reflections. This was not graded or assessed in any way, but it was meant to first acknowledge the fact that they had done their work and secondly, to ask them questions we could discuss in person later, something I did not do the first time around. This time also, I did not do any guided meditations during the contemplative stage because it hadn't really worked and we didn't have the time to train students in how to carry out meditation, but we focused on empathy development, which did work. And very importantly, they had more time to work together and this gave them more time to build an actual collaborative relationship with each other and to build more of a relationship with me. I made an effort to give them detailed and individualized feedback on their submissions, and this also generated a conversation. From the feedback came questions, from the questions, more conversations, and so on. Concerning the second group, the planned workshops were expanded into a full course uh, titled Radical Pedagogies, Nonviolence, and Change, which lasted 14 weeks. And having these extra seven weeks, as I mentioned, allowed us to do a couple of things. We were able to add new themes, which you can see here. The additional themes were the themes added by the students themselves that they wanted to discuss. And we had three weeks as well to engage in peer teaching, where students chose their own topics. They planned a class around it. They taught it. 
and they also chose a contemplative exercise and led their peers into this activity. Now, when thinking about the action research framework I discussed earlier, there are four things I would like to highlight as aspects of the project that worked well. The first is that the project succeeded in generating functional knowledge that participants could use in their own teaching practice, as we can see in the comments here. The first of these comments points to the participant feeling equipped to turn ideas into action when it comes to addressing classroom violence. The second speaks of greater awareness and new paradigms in relation to the role of nonviolence in their practice. And the final comment specifically highlights greater capability to deal with discrimination and inequality in a satisfactory manner. The second aspect of this project that worked well in a participatory dimension was the fact that, as I will show you, participants were able to collectively design strategies to bring theory into action. The poster I show you here explains participant strategies to teach and implement non a nonviolence communication framework in their classrooms. They read Marshall Rosenberg's work. He wrote a book called uh, Nonviolent Communication and he provides a specific framework. So they read this, discussed it, and then thought about ways to bring these ideas into their own practice and then share these ideas with other groups. So each group did develop their own strategies and what I'm sharing with you here is just the result of one group's work. This is another example of participants working together to collectively address a specific issue that they had identified. In this case, the issue under discussion was how to make educational spaces more democratic and participatory, and how to give students greater and louder voice. The poster shown here represents the participants' vision of what strategies might help bring that vision forward, such as decentralizing the role of the teacher, finding alternatives for assessment that do not foster competition or focus only on academic achievement, but that importantly involves the students themselves in the design, content, and format of such assessment. Finally, the poster shows how students view collaboration as key to learning. In other words, their position, um, the position that knowledge is socially constructed rather than transmitted or passed down. A third point where participatory element made an important contribution was in bringing participants together in the reflection of theory and practice. This was most evident with the second group of participants, the second iteration. They were asked to work in groups and prepare a lesson plan on a theme of their choice, including leading a contemplative exercise. Each step of the lesson had to have a rationale for being chosen. And finally, they taught this lesson to their classmates. So I'll try to show you an example, see if we can. Um... Can you see my screen okay there? So this is um, a class they taught, they, they submitted a lesson plan and then they plan a class um, that sought to bring nonviolent and nonviolent framework into their practice as an exercise. They began with an activity um, like the students had to reflect on how they were feeling by choosing a photo, one of these photos like showing different ducks and they had to identify which duck they identify with. Um, then they had to think about um, these actions that you see here and learn to recognize how other people felt on specific instances of communication and then share this reflection as a group. Then they uh, selected a video on nonviolent communication which show the specific steps of the framework and that was followed by uh, an activity they did as a group. So this is a 30 minute lesson and from the 24 participants, they were divided into groups of three or four students and each group prepare a similar lesson. And this was probably, according to the feedback they gave, the part of the project that they found the most enriching since it, it allowed for real collaboration. And it was a, basically, I took a step back and just facilitated and guided them as much as I could, but they did the entire work. I'll bring you back now to our
Finally, I would like to leave you with some of the comments from participants. Um, what these comments show is that although from a researcher perspective, there is a lot to improve on in order to make similar projects more participatory, what was done had a positive impact on participants, particularly from the viewpoint of creating community and a healthy collaborative environment. This tells us that we can take what was done and replicate it in future projects while adding those missing elements I've discussed earlier. The most important for me is the last one, which reflects an important paradigm shift. Whereas participants initially expressed several concerns about themselves and how other people treated them, they ended up, they ended the project thinking about how their actions might impact the group. For me, this was like a, a big paradigm shift in which they were thinking about others other than themselves. Concerning the challenges encountered, um, the first was working with the constraints of a university setting. Um, the main challenge this posed was that the project added to an already heavy academic workload on the participants, and this had an impact on how much they wanted to get involved. For the first iteration, for instance, the work done by participants in the first group had no credit, and Chilean students are 100% about doing what is required and what gives them credits. And this had an impact in that we started with 28 participants and ended only with 14. So the lesson here was no credit, no work. Points two and three are related. Um, due to the time constraints, we did not have time to build a relationship that would allow for a power dynamic to change and make the project more non-hierarchical. Throughout the project, I was always their teacher and in their eyes, it was always my project. And even though we got along really well, the fact that they were in class most of the time and I wasn't based at the university meant that we could not really build the kind of close relationship that would have allowed for that power dynamic to change. The next point was always a point of conflict for me that I could not fully resolve, uh, which was how to investigate the areas I was interested in, how to bring these perspectives, which I thought were important, and how to maintain some degree of control over the unfolding of the PhD while doing a project as participatory as possible. A fully participatory project would have required a much longer period of time, and of course, a PhD have very specific time constraints. And the last point refers specifically to the early stages of the research design and developing the research questions, uh, and the later stages concerning analysis and dissemination, which did not involve participant input. And more specifically, the research questions were my own, as were the choices for methodology, analysis, and dissemination of data. So as a corollary to what I have said today, there are, these are five key areas for improvement in future participatory projects. These points have been distilled from pain at all stages of action research. First, there should be time uh, built in to collectively think about what needs to be investigated and agree on a common research agenda. Decide on the tools that might be used and the research process as a whole. Who will do what, how this might be carried out, how findings will be analyzed and disseminated. And more importantly, there must be time built in to develop uh, as close and trusting a relationship as possible. So the initial hierarchy is dismantled and there is actual democratization of the research process. I will finally discuss some of the implications this study has for future research efforts. From a methodological perspective, it should be noted that research in Chile is highly institutionalized and dictated top down, either from universities themselves, either from universities themselves or through government organizations, which leaves little, if any, room for self-determined research agendas. Uh, that being the case, however, evidence from this project has shown that there is both the wherewithal and the willingness from institutions to facilitate participatory research. Even during the time when I was making initial contact with Chilean universities, there was a strong sense of enthusiasm and openness towards this approach, and specifically on the theme of nonviolence. Um, researcher Ranjit Kumar notes that action research, and I might add that this involves any of us articulations such as critical participatory action research or PAR, represents only not only a sustainable alternative to existing models, but also an opportunity for practitioners to identify problems and context-specific solutions in an autonomous manner. Kumar's collaborative research with teachers was carried out in the Maldives, in Nepal, and Afghanistan, places she indicates which are low in economic resources for research, but where engagement and collaboration were high. 
This mirrors my own experience in Chile, where research was conducted in regional universities with many low-income students who attend for free, where no external funds were used, where participants were not asked at any point to disburse their own money, and where the greatest commitment required was time. Now, navigating the participation required by PAR, however, uh, and making the classroom a truly democratic research environment is a dimension that requires work, and in particular, robust teacher training or participant training. The teacher-student relationship still retains its hierarchical roots and shifting the classroom dynamics, specifically in relation to research, which is seen as a stratified activity, necessitates a sustained long-term effort that can help shift this relational paradigm and can allow for participants to ease into their role as co-researchers. Research by Benjamin Scher notes that participatory research requires rigorous and constant reflection on the power differentials that exist among the stakeholders. Such reflection and embarking upon the shift, it must necessarily undergo um, changes and requires time, time to train participants to understand what is required of each and to build the necessary trust for participation to take place. <laughs> Let us not forget, as I have noted, that PAR originated in Latin America more than five decades ago, and the hierarchization of knowledge in that region of the world um, that PAR tries to challenge continues to exist today. Therefore, we need to generate instances for collaborative and democratic problem solving if we are to one way dismantle the colonial power structures that still exist in education. There are several current research efforts that focus on decolonization of education in Chile, such as um, uh, work on the politics of interculturalidad or the, the Spanish word for interculturality, um, insights into how decolonized school curriculum and decolonial discourse analysis on inclusive education. Given this scenario, I believe that there is a real opportunity in Chile to expand these efforts into the methodological sphere, um, as well as through participatory action research. Um, PAR aims at empowering communities, in this case the classroom, to find their own narratives and trajectories, not under the guidance of someone seen or perceived as hierarchically superior, but in collaboration and through democratization. And based on those initial conversations with Chilean universities, but mostly through the work with these participants, I can conclude that there is a great potential for community-based participatory research and that this should occupy a critical place in researchers' future efforts. Here we can learn from the work done by Apsion in well schools, for instance, or Chen with adult education practitioners in England, and Maelstrom in Sweden, and their collaborative projects with teachers and as co-researchers. Their efforts converge in attempting to democratize research by increasing competencies, eliciting equitable contributions, and focusing on research as a generative activity that draws from this collaboration. Chilean trainee teachers are already involved in action research um, during their undergrad. When they study, um, when they get a teaching degree, they have to engage in an action research project at the end. Um, this is a requirement for the graduation. Therefore, expanding this into PAR or critical participatory action research would be, in my view, a logical, coherent expansion and development. <clears throat> 